I'm going to get you started because this is an exciting panel. We're going to start the day with a bang. Our lineup of speakers in our first panel is quite impressive, as you will see. I'm really excited to introduce you today to Mark Buckley. I met Mark at Block Chance 2019, and I have come to really admire him, his brain, and his generous nature. His list of experiences and accomplishments could literally feel a book. However, when I met him prior to today uh, to discuss his introduction, he boiled a lifetime of achievements down to three words, environmentalist, ecological economist, and regenerative futurist. I'd like to add that he is an all-around good human being. He also has experience with being a hologram, as I just saw him as a hologram in the gasometer ex uh, exhibition in um, Oberhausen called Das Zerbrechliche Paradies. It's a really cool exhibit. If you're spending some time in Germany, check that out. Here to talk to us about the regenerative platform business models and to enlighten us on what the success models are for what will be game changers to put us on the right side of history. Please help me welcome the warmest of welcomes to Mark Buckley. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> Holly is most kind with her introduction, and she is also a wonderful person. So we are in 2021 at the end where we've hit December. We, we've made it. Take a deep sigh and a breath. But we're just getting going. We're just getting started. I want you to all know I'm so thankful for those of you who made it here today. Last night there was partying going on until the wee hours of the morning, um, enjoying Hamburg, enjoying after hours. And those of you who made it here today, this early morning session tells me that you want to change the future, you want to learn about new models for life, and that you're really concerned about how we move forward. Um, this block chance theme is blockchain for a positive, sustainable future. So let's keep that in mind, and I'm going to touch upon many things why that is. Um, I'm glad I'm speaking on the last day. Last time I spoke on the first day, the first session, right after Holly's bid art, I want you to know that I've looked at all the expo booths. I've talked to most of the attendees of the block chants, and I've been with them in the after parties and the lunches and the meetings. And I want you to know that I have not seen one single person with a sustainable development goal pin. I have not seen one single booth with the sustainable development goals on it. I have not seen a single person mention that. It's in their business model, in their business plan. And I have to apologize because the United Nations, who I represent, fucked up. We presented the Sustainable Development Goals to you wrong. We presented them linear, very colorful, from 1 to 17, laid out linear and lateral. People are like, who are these for? Are they for me? Are they for cities? Are they for countries? Who are they for? And if they do know what they're about, they say, oh, I'm working on number one, red. That's my favorite color, no poverty. That's the one I'm working on. And I say, great. But did you know? It is virtually impossible to work on one sustainable development goal and not touch on all the others. They are a system. They are tied together as a system. But I want to go even a step further. Did you know they are the world's first historical precedents? Historical precedents for the first time in human history. 197 countries came together for the first time ever and agreed upon a plan, a roadmap, an action to get us to 2030 and keep us at 1.5 degrees of warming. That's never happened before in entire human history that let alone two countries come together and decide where they're going to go eat lunch, let alone 197 countries decide on a plan, a roadmap for our futures. Never happened before. It is the first ever global moonshot. And because they were presented wrong, I wrote the Sustainable Development Goal Manifesto so that you could have a vision of what it would look like and feel like to live in 2030. I'm not going to read that now. The only reason this was not part of my talk, the reason I'm bringing it up, is we are, have eight years left to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals Nobody's talking about them. Nobody's working on them. Nobody has them in their business models. 
Do you think we're going to achieve them if we don't implement them? If we don't understand them? Hell no, we're not going to achieve them. And I'm talking about business models for the future. Let me tell you something that is so vital. In order to achieve the sustainable development goals, we need six major transformations. These six major transformations, one of them is the digital transformation that you, you're very well versed in. But we need to tie those transformations to sustainable development goals. And there's a set amount of monies to do that. So I've harped enough on that. I just want you to know if you haven't do it, done it, get on the ball. Otherwise, don't complain, bitch, or moan when we hit 2030 and the world doesn't look like you want to look, have it look like. Or your business doesn't look like it, like it should. I want to start off with three questions. What is your why? Some of you might know what a why is. It started from Simon Sinek. Ask yourself this to yourself. You don't even need to shout it out. The second question is, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And the last question is, before this decade is out, I will do what? What will you do by December 2030? Before this decade is out, what will you do? So if anybody's heard the saying, um, this, this very small coronavirus has, has got us all wearing masks today. It's probably made some people not want to come, some people not come to the event. But there's this other saying, if you've ever tried to sleep in a room with a mosquito, you know that it doesn't matter how big you ha are, what size you are, to make a difference. And the coronavirus is the third, the red here on the bottom, and that's the human hair on the far right. And you see in the middle there a dust particle that's kind of brown and fuzzy. I want to go um, just one step further, and that is a dust particle, a small coronavirus, can disrupt not just the room in your life, and be small enough to impact the entire world and change everything from economic models to the way we function and work and interact with each other. But it does it beyond our bedrooms, beyond our cities. It does it globally. It's disrupted us. And so I want you to think about size and the impact that you can have on the world by you being here, by implementing the right models, you can have amazing success. We are all stardust. Have you ever heard that before? We are all made up of the basic elements of life. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. Those are the basic elements of life, and we're all made up of that. My hero, he's passed away, Carl Sagan, said, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are all made of star stuff. The reason I tell you this is because those basic elements of life are the basic elements that make up our world, our earth. And there's this great thing that's called the overview effect or this cosmic perspective. And if you look at the world from outer space, the earth from outer space, about only 600 people to, to date, maybe 550, have seen this live from outer space. The rest haven't seen it live from outer space, so they don't have this feeling, but we get it through pictures, we get it through videos, we get it through satellite images, we get it from drones, this kind of feeling sometimes for those of us who haven't been to space. But it has a profound effect on humanity to say, this is our only home, our only place, our one home, and we're all global citizens, and we're all on the same spaceship Earth. We're all crew members. And so as an environmentalist, as an activist, but also as someone involved in innovation and technology in the future, I, I look at this image a lot, but this is shown in the environmental climate movement quite a bit. You know why? 
Because they want to show you that there's no nations, borders, divisions of humanity one from another. That we're all on this spaceship earth together. I show this to you for two different reasons. Two very important reasons. And I don't think you've ever looked at it like this before. But if you have, come up to me later and tell me about it. Why do you think I show you this image? First, because I want you to realize you're that star stuff that ma makes up this planet, and you crawled out of the primordial soup of this planet, from the elements of this planet. You weren't dropped off on some spaceship Germany, here in Germany, planted on this earth. You crawled out of this earth from your mother, most likely, but our original beginnings came from this primordial soup. Secondly, I show this to you because this has a meaning. How do we have this image? We have it because it's sheer innovation. Had we not gone to the moon, had we not, had John F. Kennedy not went before Congress and said, before this decade is out, we're going to put men on the moon. And he had less than 10 years to do that, and he made it happen. We're at that same point in time in our world that we have less than 10 years left, eight years left to reach the Paris Agreement. Before this decade is out, are we going to save humanity? Because the earth will be fine. Are we going to save humanity's future and how we live? Or are we going to go from face masks to gas masks? I show you this image because it's sheer innovation. Had we not gone to space, we wouldn't even know about all this stuff. We wouldn't have looked back at Earth by accident. This is sheer computing power, technology, emerging technologies that didn't exist when John F. Kennedy says, we're going to put people on the moon. And then within that time frame, what did they develop? Everything to get us to the moon, to get us this image. Every single moment of our day, every second, we have satellites and data giving us the heartbeat, the pulse of our earth. This is sheer innovation. That's what that image is. It's not some tree hugger or some environmental activist. It's sheer innovation. And why are we here talking about blockchain? It's an emerging technology. It's innovation. It can change our world. It can make a transformation. But I need you to look at it right, and I need you to understand the big picture, the cosmic perspective, and the model behind how the world really works. This is a timeline of our, of our Earth birth. It's a centric timeline that starts at Earth birth and goes until today. On the far left, you see bacteria. Those basic elements of life went from that to bacteria. And from bacteria to today, we still have microorganisms and bacteria on our planet. But that's how life on Earth began, a single-celled organism that went to a nucleated cell. And then you see this timeline shift across to the present-day moment. And you see these little pockets. Those are mass extinctions. We've had five of them. The last and biggest one was when the uh, uh, asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs. And so you see that pocket of dinosaurs there. Uh, I show this to you for a reason. This is another tree of life. It's called the bacteria tree of life. And it's new. It didn't come out until 2015. But the reason I show it to you is this purple section on the top right wasn't discovered until 2015. You know why that discovery is so important? It's because that is bacteria, that's candida, and the majority of that branch lives in our bodies, our guts, gives us gut health, gives us nutrition and vitality. It, it heals us from disease and ailments if we keep it healthy. People are calling it, and doctors are calling it, scientists calling it their second brain. This wasn't even discovered until 2015. That's an innovation of discovery in science. 
If you know anything about bacteria, you know the majority of the human body is made up of three kingdoms of bacteria and microbes, and the majority of our body, on our skin, in our stomach, it's all made up of these microorganisms. And if you look at the human cells of a person, they are less than 30 trillion, just above the knee, but the microbial cells in our body are the majority, and they make up just over or just under 100 trillion microbial cells. The microbial genes make up just under 2 million microbial genes, and the human genes are just at the tip of our toes, half of our foot, less than 23,000. Now, what in the hell does this have to do with blockchain and emerging technology blockchain, right? Well, it has to do everything because we are an ecosystem. Our bodies are an ecosystem. And if we understand how the world works and how it always works, is a that's important. Miracle. In one handful of soil, there are more organisms than there are humans on Earth. And we are only beginning to understand this vast network of beings right beneath our feet. We rely on healthy soil for 95% of what we eat. Yet, we take it for granted. Thousands of years of plowing, deforestation, and erosion. To racial, sexual, and religious chauvinism, and to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We are one planet. So the reason I show you those two things is in one handful of soil there's more microorganisms than there are human beings on our planet. Billions more than there are human beings on our planet. The second video was Carl Sagan, who had that quote that I read in the beginning, and he said, there's this new consciousness developing that sees the earth as a single organism. An organism divided amongst itself is doomed. That's why nations and borders and, and models for organizations and how we build up our companies and do business and work continue to fail. We've operated on some models in the history of humanity that keep repeating themselves. Not only do we have 10 now hominid ancestors, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthal, that are no longer here. 10 others besides Homo sapiens. So there's 11 in total. We're the 11th that's still here. Those other 10 aren't here. That's brought up a lot. But did you know that there's more than 21 Civilization frameworks, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, the Greeks, the Romans, those are civilizations just a few thousand years ago. They're also not here anymore. They weren't some knuckle-dragging Neanderthal. They were pretty advanced. They had roads and infrastructure. They had innovations. They had flowing water. They had structures. But why aren't they here anymore? If you look at Alexander the Great as he's riding his horse through the Middle East, he describes it as lush, lavish, green, tons of great food. The most beautiful area to describe. Words didn't give it justice. And if you ride your horse through that same area today, it's pretty easy to describe. Hotter than hell, desert, sand, a little oasis here, a little oasis there. But there's not a lot there. It's gone. All these civilization frameworks collapsed, all of them, and, and 18 of them collapsed because of ecological or environmental collapse, which ties to infrastructure, to food, to basic resources. That's why they collapsed. And the other ones collapsed because of displacement, conflict, fight between nations and humanity. So 
my title of this talk is Regeneration, a World that Works for Everyone, because we want to look at models for our businesses, for society, for humanity that work. What the word regenerative means creating conditions conducive for life, continuously renewing itself to transcend into new forms and flourish amid ever-changing life conditions. What is an organism? Something that's continually moving, changing, growing, exponentially evolving. And that's what an organization is, a business, a company, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's for profit, whether it's public, whether it's private. The, the word organization comes from that basic word where we come from. I'm sorry you weren't giving, given an operating manual for this spaceship Earth when you were born. Okay, now this is how you have children, this is how you live, this is how you conduct. But our Buck Minister Fuller, in 1969, published this book, The Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And the reason I show it to you is because it's pretty phenomenal. Now, I started with those three questions, and one of them was why. This is the inside cover of those books that I just showed you. On the inside cover on the top left, um, he wrote his why down in 1969. I want to read it to you. To make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone. Amazing. He knew his why, he knew a Simon Sinek before Simon Sinek probably was even born. And it was one for the entire world. This is Imaginal Cells book. And this is Kim Pullman. I only show that to you because this next video that I sh want to show you has to do with the transform transformative state that humanity is in now and how we can emerge with better models for the future. Around the world, people are waking up. They know we need change, and not just at the edges. We need to change our systems, not just our straws. But the question remains, how does change happen? In the face of these mounting crises, it can feel hopeless, but it shouldn't. Because there is a blueprint for change, buried deep in nature. It's a story of transformation, encoded at the deepest level of being. The imaginal cell. A cell that contains within it a vision of something new, of something better. The caterpillar, while alive, consumes. But this cannot go on forever. Everything has an end. Everything has a tipping point. All that is left is decay. But from this place of darkness, something new can be born. At first, the caterpillar fights this new presence, what we want is more learning in schools and less activism. seeing it as a threat, clinging to its old form. But the imaginal cells persist in spite of this. They begin to emit a common frequency. They cluster, they form collectives, until eventually they reach a critical mass. They can no longer be opposed. In time, the old yields to the new, and something beautiful emerges. So know this, the future is not foreclosed. Alternative worlds are possible. A world where hope matters more than despair. A world where care matters more than profit. A world where solidarity matters more than self-interest. Change can happen, and change is coming. Are you in? I'm definitely in this says treat others and the planet as you wish to be treated it's the golden rule it's been around since humanity's been around if we work in symbiosis with our world with our planet it's a better business model it's also um, interesting this is Lynn Margulis she was Carl Sagan who I've talked about a couple times now his first wife and she is a very famous scientist. She turned the scientific community on its head because she went against 
neoliberalism and neo-Darwinism, which basically is the fact that a lot of people misinterpreted what Darwin was talking about and said, natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, severe competition is the way that our world works. Absolutely not. She said, not only is that not how our world works, our world works in symbiosis and has always. That's how we emer emerged out of this primordial soup. That's how our atmosphere became breathable through these microbes and this symbiosis that continues to work. And for those of you who don't know what symbiosis is, I suggest you read these books, look up Lynn Margulis, research it a little bit. And the reason is why, because it's a ecological phenomenon. Symbiosis is an ecological phenomenon that is the most innovative, fastest, and exponential growing phenomenon in our world today. When we adapt it, when we put it into our business models, our lifestyle, and we get into harmony with nature and our environment, we thrive, we flourish. The air is better, our world's better, our food's better. We live in abundance because we are living in a non-extractive economy. We are supporting nature to restore and regenerate. It's a different it model. And suddenly, everything changes. Take transport. Horses were the main way of getting around for thousands of years. Carriages got better, and their use spread. But the transport system remained the same. At the dawn of the 20th century, a convergence occurred that opened a window of extraordinary new possibilities. Innovations in steel and rubber production, the pneumatic tire, the combustion engine, made possible an affordable and functioning car. But there were huge barriers. Early cars were expensive and unreliable. There were no paved roads, no supply chains or mechanics, no manufacturing capacity, and few oil wells or refineries. Few people knew how to drive. Outside a few enthusiasts tinkering in their workshops, no one recognized the possibilities, least of all the horse and carriage industry, which dismissed early cars as a rich person's toy. But as costs and capabilities improved rapidly, the niche expanded through a self-reinforcing cycle of increasing demand and economies of scale, cost reductions, increasing investment, and accelerating innovation. The invention of the moving production line in car finance made cars even more affordable. The horse and carriage industry could not compete. Their deep expertise in the old system, their inability to see beyond their narrow lens, was their greatest liability. It's why disruptors always come from outside the incumbency. By the time the establishment realized what was happening, it was too late. The S-curve had overtaken them. Within 20 years, they were destroyed by a death spiral of dwindling demand, escalating costs, plummeting investment, and reversing economies of scale. Cars could go faster, further, carry more load, and created new market opportunities far beyond the niche of the horse. Cascading impacts were unleashed that changed everything. The transport industry was transformed, but so too were agriculture, retail, and mining, where we lived and worked, the structure of our cities, Cars transformed war, health, geopolitics, and the environment. They created previously unthinkable possibilities, both good and bad. This is our secret, a lens that reveals what goes on beneath the surface, where the complex forces that drive the patterns of change play out. Predicting the future based on past trends can help in times of stability, but in periods of rapid change, it can lead to big mistakes. That's because disruption isn't a straight line. It comes with rapid change and sweeping, far-reaching consequences that can transform entire industries in a handful of years. Who would have thought the smartphone could disrupt the oil industry? But that's what's so fascinating about disruption. It's not limited to technology, but has the power to change society at large, even civilization itself. It's time for us to rethink so I showed you that for an important reason, because it's the quickest way I can tell you how we make transformations and how innovation and emerging technologies play into that. And it was only one example, even though it tickled on a few others, 
in the automotive industry. As you know, the biggest disruptor was Henry Ford in the production line, right? But when he finished that wonderful innovation, he still have, didn't have gas stations. He didn't have people who got a driver's license or learned how to drive. He still didn't have roads to drive his cars on. So there was a lot of limitation. So what did he need? Well, he needed the Rockefellers and many others to build the infrastructure. What are the sustainable development goals? They're a sustainable infrastructure. What is resilience? What is regenerative models? They're an infrastructure for your model, for your operation to drive on, to flow in, to transform society, to transform the future exponentially. So, yes, we might be doing emerging technologies. We might be using blockchain. We might be using AI. We might be using machine learning and these things. But if they're running on a horse and carriage or on fossil fuels, which are stranded assets, we're never going to have a truly exponential emerging technology until we modify our infrastructure and our models that those businesses operate on. No matter how innovative and cool Tesla cars are in the Model X, he still had to build, Elon Musk still had to build a, um, a charging station infrastructure. He had to do the renewable energy transition. He had to build the gigafactories. He had to build the batteries. He had to address the insurance companies and the banking and the leasing and the whole infrastructure, or he had to rely on other people to help him to do that. Regeneration isn't just a new thing. A lot of people think it's a buzzword. It's actually been around for a long time. The first scientist in hum in humanity to really, that's well known, to write and draw about it is Leonardo da Vinci. But in the last five years, we've been hearing a lot of hype, and when people have asked me a lot to speak on regeneration, they always think because I come from an agriculture, a food, and a farming background that I'm going to speak on regenerative agriculture. I want you to know it's a new economic model. It's a new model for life and business, period, because it's one that restores and regenerates and works in symbiosis and harmony with nature. Now, this is not esoteric or tree hugger stuff. This is real science. This is real business. And there is a way to integrate it into our models using emerging technologies to do it right. This is Paul Hawken. He wrote the book Drawdown, how, how the most comprehensive plan to draw down a world in global warming. And this is his book that just came out in September called Re regeneration. And he talks about these models and these transformations in our world that we can see, but they tie to systems thinking. And, and this is our planet. I, I want to give you some examples. So if you don't know about systems or how to think in this way, in what direction as an organization, there are five systems of our Earth, our Earth systems hydrosphere, atmosphere, cryosphere, biosphere, all. Five of them work a gooey or independent of each other. But as you remember, we had an ozone layer leak. We fixed that to a certain extent, but the other four systems did not control our ozone layer, our atmosphere. They all work independently, but if one breaks down, the other four try to compensate to heal that one. Let me give you one other example. Our body has 11 systems. They all work independently. There's not one of these 11 systems that controls the other 10. But if one of them breaks down, you break a bone or you have a nervous system disorder, the other 10 try to compensate so that you don't die, you don't, or maybe you become disabled or you get sick for a while. But they all work gooey in harmony together. These systems, one doesn't control the other. There is a model a structure, how the world works. And this is really system science. This is Fritz Hof Capra. He wrote a few books, very famous, Tao of Physics, but a, a course book called The Systems View of Life. And he teaches systems thinking and system science, systemic thinking. This is a business Canva, which most of you know, which was pretty big about eight, ten years ago, 
one page business Canva value pr uh, prospect with a systems dynamic model overlaid on the top of it on how it really works, which you can run out thousands of scenarios. Now, I'm here to tell you the future, and you'll, a lot of you will know this, especially the techno, uh, technology savvy and programmers and developers, platform models are fabulous. And innovation and technology and developing, they've been used for a long time. And most of the big companies that are successful use a platform model. But did you know you can use a regenerative platform systems dynamic model, and then you have a model that works in symbiosis, that works the way the world works regeneratively? Um, I, I kind of want to skip through some of this regenerative economy and, and how um, the world works with this new model. It's no longer linear. It's no longer siloed. It's systemic, the way the world really works, because we address all facets of global grand challenges, of all problems in our world, instead of just saying, oh, we're only going to address the siloed facet here and hope that it gets solved. In 2018, all international organizations realized that the only way to solve, sorry, only way to solve global grand challenges was through a systemic approach. Human suffering and global grand challenges can only be solved through systems approach, not a siloed or linear approach. We all feel on edge because that's exactly where we are. But there is hope. Right now, technologies are converging deep in the foundations of our civilization. Over the coming decade, they will disrupt the world as we know it and open a window of extraordinary opportunity. We could end poverty and inequality, repair our planet, and free ourselves from conflict. But there's a catch. If we fail to see what's coming, things could go bad. At RethinkX, we've developed a lens to see what's really happening. Change doesn't travel in a straight line. It ripples and cascades after long periods of stability. Big change happens fast. This is true in every system, from cells to industries, and even civilizations. Throughout history, every civilization has been built on the same five foundational sectors, information, energy, transport, food, and materials. When technologies disrupt any of these, change ripples and cascades, challenging our rules, systems, and even our mindsets. Our ancestors developed leading civilizations by harnessing these disruptions, yet each breakthrough only allowed us to become more advanced at extracting scarce resources. In the age of extraction, humanity is forced to create unequal systems to remain competitive and expand beyond our limits to survive. It is a tragic story that repeats always ending in a dark age. Until now. For the first time in history, as our old world collapses, we have a chance to break through. Today, all five foundational sectors are being disrupted at once, creating new ways of producing everything we need. The smartphone became our new printing press, transforming how we connect, vote, and travel. Solar, wind, and battery will allow us to create our own energy. We're hacking biology so communities can make their own food and materials. Meanwhile, AI, robotics, and nanotechnology will allow us to build most of what we need at a fraction of the cost. Multiplied together, these creation age technologies mean we no longer have to extract scarce resources. Everyone can create what they need to live a good life. Exploitation and scarcity can be replaced by freedom and superabundance.
But these new technologies will accelerate the collapse of the old. Trapped in tunnel vision, like our ancestors, we cling to failing systems, applying Band-Aid solutions, which seals our fate. Only a new lens can reveal the possibility space that is opening. This is what allows us to rethink everything. Our mindsets, institutions, so as I wrap up, uh, because I only have a minute left, I just want you to know that the systems are collapsing that are out there, and Band-Aid solutions, as we cling to these outdated old systems that don't work, and, and as humanity, we tend to do that. There's examples like Kodak Eastman, but I mentioned to you not only about the hominids and that the civilization collapsed, but there's been a framework, a model, that up until now has been predominant. It's called the hierarchy model. It's in every civilization that's ever collapsed, every business model that has failed or has to be bailed out is based on a hierarchy model. Every single one. There is none that are regenerative in symbiosis other than when you look into nature. There's divided into classes of humanity one from another. And these are kind of humorous, you know, the top-down mentality. I want you to know the world's first trillionaire will be a green entrepreneur oper operating in symbiosis with a regenerative platform, systems dynamic business model. We will take a shift from this hierarchical model of ego to a one of eco, which many of us are on already, and then we will go to this stage of regeneration, selfless service to life, called seva, which is an old Sanskrit word, where humanity will be in nature and in symbiosis with everything in our world. That will be a world of abundance, of, of cl clean working systems that absolutely work. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mark Buckley, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. Life Chance 2021.